So I want to take a look at the first way that Kant formulates the categorical imperative. Now, remember, uh, the categorical imperative is the form that reason takes when it speaks to the will, uh, when, it, when reason tells me what I ought to do. And that ought, as a command, is an imperative. And the categorical part, of course, is the, the way that reason commands universally always in the same way for everyone. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment, Kant says that's not just the form that the categorical imperative takes. That form is, in an important way, its content. But now, to sort of back our way into this, remember that if uh, I think about a hypothetical command, a hypothetical imperative, this could be anything, right? There are infinite possible commands within infinite possible circumstances. And so in advance, Kant says, I don't know what a hypothetical imperative is going to say. You're going to have to fill in those specific conditions. By contrast, a categorical imperative, there can be only one categorical imperative. If there were even two, then they would either command the same person to do different things, or they would command different people in the same situation. Uh, morality always commands everyone everywhere to do the right thing. And so therefore, there can be only one categorical imperative. Uh, and Kant says that that universality is its content. In other words, to put it this way, if the categorical imperative doesn't just tell you to act a certain way, if it tells everyone to act a certain way to do the right thing, and if it doesn't tell you just to do the right thing now, but always, then that universality is a way of thinking about what it means to do the right thing. In other words, if the right thing is the right thing for you, it ought to be the right thing for anybody, everywhere, always. And so, to think about morality in terms of not just what you should do, but what anybody should do, Kant says in that way we can then think about what morality tells you to do. Morality is telling you to do whatever it is everybody ought to do. I know, that's still kind of a confusing way of putting it. Uh, it's going to get maybe a little bit more confusing because, of course, Kant says the way we can put it is this. Act only on that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Now, before we uh, unpack that much, let's just focus on this term maxim. In a footnote, Kant is going to tell you that a maxim is a subjective principle of acting. So, subjective principle, right? Not uh, an objective law, but a subjective, a, a principle that you give yourself. Kant is here going to point out something really important. And that is, uh, as we've talked about, say, Aristotle in the past, we focused on the fact that as a human being, as a rational creature, you make decisions. But the important point that Kant is drawing our attention to is that when you make decisions, you're not just mentally flipping a coin or rolling a die or making an arbitrary uh, determination, right? To make a decision in concrete circumstances, you are drawing on not just specific situation uh, details, but also general rules or, again, as we keep calling them, principles. Imagine you are sitting in class and you are thirsty. What do you do? You know the specific situation and the specific inclination. I have thirst, but how do you decide what to do? Well, you're going to start to think about things like, well, do I have a drink with me right now, right? Uh, your neighbor has a drink. Do you just reach over and grab theirs? No, of course not. Why not? Well, because it's wrong just to take someone else's drink, right? It would be wrong and weird. But notice, that's not just right now. It's always wrong and weird to just reach over and grab your neighbor's drink, right? That's a general rule that applies within this specific situation. 
You might think about whether or not you can get up and go out into the hallway to get a drink, but the kinds of things you're going to think about there aren't just things that apply in this situation. They're going to be general, right? When is it okay to slip out of class? In what way is it okay to slip out of class? Uh, are there just five minutes of class left? Is there still an hour left? Can I get out without disturbing people? Can I get out without making a ruckus, etc.? right? But these are all general rules that you have, principles, that by applying them to the specific situation, you can figure out what to do. So now, if Kant is right, and if rational creatures like us act according to rules we give ourselves, then when I look at your action, what I can ask myself is, remember, not just what did you do, but why did you do it? And if I'm thinking about why you did something, the why that I'm looking at there is actually not just how did you make this specific decision, but what rules are you applying to yourself? And if Kant is right, then morality isn't just about specific decisions you make. Morality is about which rules you give yourself. And so the way we can think about morality is it's not about doing the right thing so much as it's about giving yourself the right rules. And which rules should you give yourself? The rules that everyone ought to give themselves. And that's not as circular and empty as it sounds, right? Because there are lots of rules that you could give yourself that you either wouldn't want everyone to give themselves, or maybe you even couldn't imagine everyone giving themselves. So within the first formulation of the categorical imperative, Kant is going to try to show you that when you are going to do the wrong thing, you are going to contradict yourself somehow. We're going to find that there's just a, a logical contradiction such that your will is automatically in conflict with itself. And so uh, we'll find other ways to think about morality as this book goes along, but right here is just one way of thinking through what it means to do the right thing, to give yourself rules self-consistently and to give yourself rules that everyone ought to give themselves. And so it might be helpful to really work through some, uh, one of the examples that Kant provides here as a way to sort of uh, try to unpack that a little further. Before we get into the examples, though, I just wanted to point something out. Uh, and that is, you know, Kant is going to use these same four examples twice, uh, following each of the first two formulations of the categorical imperative. And you're going to notice they are stupid examples, right? Should you uh, kill yourself? No, you shouldn't. Is it okay to lie to your friends? No, it's not okay to lie to your friends. Uh, is laziness okay? No, it's right. But here's the thing. I think these examples are intentionally stupid because it's not about what answer we get. It's about how we get that answer. It's not about just the conclusion, it's about the procedure that we go through. And so if we can work through and get a nice explicit procedure for getting to that fairly obvious answer, then that same procedure will work when we actually get to hard moral questions, right? And there are lots of hard moral questions in the world, but if we just try to think through a hard problem automatically, then we're getting all turned around and confused. The nice thing about these very clear-cut examples is that if we can just work through and make explicit the steps that we go through, then by applying those same steps later on, now we'll get clearer answers to harder questions. So we could really work through any of the four examples that Kant gives, uh, and I encourage you to take another one of the examples and work through it on your own. I have to admit my favorite example is example number two, uh, about the person who needs to borrow money. So let's just kind of work through this idea together. Uh, I want you to imagine that I am uh, broke, 
and my landlord comes to me and says, listen, you know, you have got to uh, pay up on rent or I'm going to evict you. Right now I am in trouble. I need help. So I come to you, my best friend of years. How long have we been friends? And I say to you, listen, I really need to borrow some money. And I tell you how much I need to borrow. I don't know, $2,000, right? Now that's a big ask, as we like to say these days. But here's the thing, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, you would certainly help me out if you can. You maybe have the money to give me right now, but you really need that money back two weeks from now. Uh, very important something coming up, a kidney operation, your mom's birthday, something. And so you might say to me, listen, uh, Matthew, I would love to loan you this money. And I will, as long as you can promise to pay me back two weeks from today. Now, two weeks from today? I mean, if I was going to have $2,000 two weeks from now, I could probably just dodge my landlord until then, right? No way am I going to have the money to pay you back in two weeks. But if I tell you that I'm not going to have the money to pay you back, what are you going to say to me? You're going to say, well, listen, I, I wish I could help. I would love to help, but I can't. I'm so sorry, right? Now, if I promise you that I will pay you back, you'll give me the money, right? Now, I know full well I can't pay you back, but what if I were to promise to pay you back anyway? In other words, what if I were to make you a lying promise? Okay, now let's think this through, right? What is it that I am willing? What is it that I need to say in order for all of this to work, right? Well, what is a promise? A promise is not just a prediction, right? I'm not just predicting I'm going to do something. A promise is a vow. You are binding yourself to some future action. And in order for promises to be accepted, they need to actually bind us, right? I'm not just saying I'll probably pay you back. I am saying I absolutely will. I am binding myself. But if I bind myself, then I'm going to have to do something in two weeks that I know I can't do. And so I don't want a promise to bind me. But of course, if I don't make you a promise, if I don't bind myself, you won't loan me the money. I want you to accept my promise, so I want to be bound by that promise. But I don't want to be bound by that promise because I can't do it, so I don't want to be bound. And now you begin to see the contradiction, right? I want promising to bind people because I want you to accept my promise, but I don't want promising to bind me because I can't fulfill the thing I'm promising to do. And so what I'm trying to do here is to make an exception for myself. I want promising to bind people, but I don't want this promise to bind me. I'm trying to make an exception for one time only, Kant says, right? Whatever it is. But I'm still trying to make an exception. And that is how you know you're doing something wrong, right? You are trying to act in a way that you don't think everyone ought to act, or maybe that you can't imagine everyone acting. What if promising never bound anybody? Well, then you wouldn't accept my promise and you just wouldn't loan me the money. What happens if promising always binds? Well, then I can't make that promise if I know I'm not going to be able to fulfill it. And so two important things to notice here, right? First of all, there is a contradiction. As Kant will say, it's a contradiction in my will. It's not between my actions and anything else going on in the world. It's a contradiction in myself. I am contradicting myself. I don't need you to disapprove of my actions. I already disapprove of them in some way, right? I am at odds with myself. And second of all, the other really important thing here is the form that immorality takes is making an exception for yourself. So here, uh, Kant will say, if we now attend to ourselves in any transgression of duty, right? Any failure to do your duty, any shirking of your duty, then we'll find that we actually do not will 
that our maxim should be a universal law, right? The rule that I give myself should apply to everybody because this is impossible for us. It is impossible to will that everyone ought to act in the wrong way. Everyone ought to act in the right way. It's impossible to consistently will the opposite. So if I'm going to find a contradiction, it's because uh, the opposite of this maxim should remain universal law, but we make an exception for ourselves, or just for this one time, to the advantage of our inclination. And so now, to bring it back to the diagram that I drew for you last time, remember, really, there are two sources of action, two sources of rules uh, for what I will, right? At any given time, I can do what reason tells me to do. In other words, what reason tells everyone to do, the universal valid thing. Or I can do what my desire tells me to do. I can do what I want to do, that particularly valid thing. And again, as I said last time, you know, if they both tell you to do the same thing, awesome, right? But as soon as they tell you to do two different things, if I am acting according to reason. If I am doing what I ought to do, then I am doing what everyone in my circumstances ought to do. If I am not doing what everyone ought to do, if I'm looking to make an exception for myself, the only other thing that I can be doing is acting according to my desire, acting according to my inclination. To act according to my desires, I will then sometimes contradict myself. And remember, reason, logic, always self-consistent, right? Never contradicts itself. That's kind of a, a first fundamental law of logic, right? Don't contradict yourself. Desire, by contrast, well, my desires contradict themselves all over the place, right? I, because I have multiple desires, and to desire one thing is not to say that you don't desire something else or even the opposite, right? Friday night rolls around, it's the end of a long week, and I want to stay home. Friday rolls around, and I haven't seen my friends all week, I want to go out, right? I can simultaneously want to go out and want to stay home. I can have both of those desires, even though they contradict each other. I just can't self-consistently decide to do both, right? And so acting, I'll have to take that step of trying to be consistent. But my desires contradict themselves all the time. And so anytime I'm contradicting myself, that's a sign that I'm not acting according to reason. I'm acting according to desire. So furthermore, it's this contradiction between desire and reason that sets human beings and human wills the problem that they have, right? Because again, it's not always the case that what I want to do and what I ought to do are the same thing. And anytime there's a conflict, now as a human being, I have to choose to do the right thing. That's my duty, that's my obligation, even though I have reasons to do the wrong thing, right? I want to do something else. And so it's going to be working through this problem that makes morality an issue for creatures like us. So as we move forward through the book, we'll see why there are a couple of other ways that Kant wants to formulate the categorical imperative. But already then, Kant says, we've, we've seen how the universality of morality gives us that content of right, right and wrong, uh, that supreme principle of morality. 